I'm Mario Martinez Jr., CEO and founder of Ingresso, and we are the creators of FlyMessage.io, the free personal writing assistant and text expander application. On each episode of this podcast, you will hear from sales leaders, practitioners, and influencers to help you grow your sales numbers at scale. So get your pen and paper or iPad and keyboard and start taking notes as you're now listening to The Moderate Selling Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Modern Selling Podcast. I'm excited. Uh, Today's topic, all about leadership, resilience, mindset. That's what we're going to be spending some time talking about with my friend, Mr. Sebastian Chique. I like that. I like the way you pronounce the name. Uh, It is a phenomenal (laughs) name with a great great pronunciation at the end. Uh, And Sebastian is actually the founder and CEO, also an angel investor and business investor uh, of his own individual company, Sebastian Chiquet, which focuses specifically on helping leaders lead teams to high-performing organizations. Sebastian, welcome to the show, my friend. Mario, it's a pleasure to be here. It's amazing talking to you today, brother. Well, I'm excited to have this topic. We haven't had some leadership insights in a while, and I'm sure all of our listeners, including those individual sellers that are listening in and or business owners, uh, will be able to glean some great value from this conversation. So do me a favor, uh, talk a little bit about yourself, give us a little history and background about yourself, and then I've got one very important special question. Okay, I'm looking forward to the special question. So yeah, I'm Sebastian Schieke. I'm um... I'm German, yeah. So um, I actually I grew up in East Germany, yeah. So on the in the socialist part of Germany um, before the wall came down, and um, yeah. So growing up in a in a in a country where entrepreneurship actually didn't exist, yeah. So everyone belonged to the the community, yeah. And uh, they they told us, yeah. In the end, <laughs> everything belonged to to the government, and. Uh, yeah, it was uh, the first 14 years of my life I spent there. And um, also entrepreneurship hardly didn't exist. Um, I was inspired by my mother yeah, because despite all the odds, despite all the hardship uh, people faced in a communist country, she ran her own shop as a hairdresser. Yeah? So after we moved over to, to West Germany, basically right after the wall came down in, the, in, the, in January 1990, um, yeah, I I was exposed to uh, to this world of freedom of uh, opportunities and uh, um, the we had some relatives over in, in West Germany and uh, they also run their own business and this inspired me you know their their the opportunities they had the possibilities and of course also their financial freedom so this sort of sought the seeds for me to uh, start my own own business and. Uh, I started quite young, uh, age of uh, 16 or 17, I started selling PCs, you know, I was back in the in the old, uh, the times of the golden age of IT, yeah, where everyone who could basically spell IT could create a business. <laughs> so I started to sell IT computer, then I started as an IT consultant, uh, working in banks and uh, in, in big, big corporates here in, in, in Frankfurt, still being a student actually, so I was a well-dressed student uh, going in a suit uh, through, <laughs> through town working as a consultant and uh, yeah so it started and then uh, in the year 2000 i founded my first company um basically offering treasury management services to corporates banks and financial institutions i run this business for 22 years so basically retired last year um i also started a, a marketing agency in between and uh, and uh, Sort of after these twenty years, I realized, hey, my my heart really uh, for for startups and, and small organizations who create an impact in the world. So I became a business angel investor. Yeah? I invest in uh, in uh, primarily software as a service companies, and uh, I also um, founded Sebastian Chic and Company, where we help CEOs of fast growing tech companies to yeah develop this. Uh, this resilient leadership and to create high performance teams because we believe that this is the basis for constant growth. 
I love it. Uh, so congratulations on on the retirement, but not being retired. Uh, I would like to have had that conversation, or at least been not not had the conversation. Excuse me, been there when you had the conversation with your uh, wife, and you said, "Honey, I'm retiring for 22 years, and now you're back out there again uh, having fun," <laughs> <laughs> which is awesome because we get to learn from your experience, no doubt. One of the questions I always ask all my guests uh, is tell us something nobody knows about you, even if they're <laughs> looking at any or all of your social profiles. And Sebastian, uh, I'm looking for something juicy, but I don't want any confessions. That's all okay. I want. You. Well, very good question. Let me think. Hmm. Yeah, there's something very really funny. Actually, you won't believe it. Yeah, we have cockroaches as home pets. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Let's rewind for that for a second. I got, I got to understand what you mean by that. Um, meaning all the little cockroaches that run around the house uh, at nighttime when you flip on the lights, those are your pets? Well, we, we don't have them running around in, in Europe, you know? I mean, I, I, I saw this in the US and, and uh, in, in Australia, but uh, actually I have a son and he's 11 years old and he's in a, in a garden gardening group in his, in his school. And uh, uh, this gardening group, they, uh, or at least he thought uh, that they wanted to have cockroaches as as uh, animals, you know, to uh, to look at, and, and and so we went to an exhibition here in Frankfurt, and uh, he said, yeah, can can we buy ten of those cockroaches and I bring them next week to the school? I said, yeah, why not? You know, we put them in a box, you know, no one would be harmed. So we bought them, and um, the teacher said, oh, I, I think we misunderstood this, you know, uh, we, we don't really want them in, in school. It, it was his imagination. My son really wanted the school to have them, but the teacher had a different opinion. So at the moment we have them at home in a box, you know, and yes, uh, we will see you how the story ends. <laughs> oh, no. So, 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 okay. Well, the good news is you don't have them all running around everywhere and, and they're all, all over the house. But the better news, is, the worst news is, excuse me, is uh, that your son had this great idea to bring him as a class pet and the teacher said no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so hopefully his, um, uh, he wasn't crushed when that happened uh, and he understood uh, he that... loves them, you know. He he always said, "Dad, can we keep them?" I said, "No, I don't think so." <laughs> oh no! So what? I have to have a conversation with, with the teacher. What did they eat? What did they eat? I, that's what I don't. I, well, I'm curious. Like they eat, they eat uh, like cucumbers and and uh, lettuce and this kind of stuff, you know. Okay, um, all right. So roughage, then uh, you know vegetables. Yeah. Uh, that yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Very interesting. Um, uh, does he hold them? Yes, he loves animals, you know. Uh, oh. He puts them in oh. his hand, you know. I couldn't take it. I couldn't take it. <laughs> Give me a hammer. <laughs> the last time I spent a couple of weeks in Australia a couple of years ago, and uh, in the Sydney, they were running around the house, you know. And, and the, you got up at night, you went to the kitchen, get a drink, and then, wow. <laughs> ah, they were there running. I know that happens every once in a while, especially in tropical places, especially in yeah. tropical places. All right. Well, uh, so first time ever uh cockroaches contained as a pet i haven't heard that one before that's a good one <laughs> quite funny and i would never allow it in my own house uh not even me that's that's too much uh but that having been said uh love that story well let, let's get right into some meat here right we've got sales leaders enablement leaders marketing leaders business owners sales reps that listen into the show you talk a lot about uh resilient leadership you also talk about leadership as a whole and helping to develop uh, startup companies or uh, organizations that want to have hyper growth. First off, what is resilient leadership and how do you do it? How do you make it happen? Yeah, I mean, resiliency is a word which is often used, yeah, but um, if you look at the context, the world we live in, you know, this this uh, VUCA world, I probably, most of you heard this, this acronym VUCA, but uh, many probably not. VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And this is this explains the world we live in at the moment. This phrase was coined by the Americans uh, um, after the, um, this, the, the, the separation from the East and West uh, sort of dissolved. You know, when the Soviet Union, when the wall came down, before that, it was a stable um, situation. You know, you had the East and the West and uh, everything was clear. But then after the wall came down, this whole um, this whole uh, political world sort of uh, became very uh, different. You know, you had small countries rising up and you didn't have this stability anymore. So they coined this phrase, uh, um, this acronym VUCA, to describe this uh, 
volatile world, so constant changes, uncertainty, complexity, and uh, ambiguity. And fast forward now, <laughs> 50 plus years, um, it's it's completely, I mean, it's completely accelerated the world we live in. Yeah. So leaders, they really have to develop um, antidotes to um, uh, to this uh, um, to this to this world we live in to be able to to navigate themselves and their business through this ever changing times and resiliency is uh, is something which um, which we teach which is very important that whenever you you face a hardship whenever you face a situation in life which sort of brings you down which happens often and it happens um in an on an increasing way that um you really have the ability to get up you know to focus to to develop this mental toughness to stay focused on your goals and and uh and your big why why you why are you doing this in the end and and this is uh this is a, a basic very important ingredients for success uh so <clears throat> makes sense uh the question then becomes is doesn't every leader feel like that they're you know resilient that they've got the mindset for success and um that they're uh, um, uh, focused in on the right things, uh, or are we not generally like that? Well, I would I would uh, argue that we are not generally like that. I mean, uh, yes, everyone um, thinks they have it, but um, and you see how how some of them really lead their organization and their teams. Yeah, I mean, what does a Resilient leader show. He shows certainty. You know, he shows uh, that he all, always find a way that he's resourceful. But and if he is really that strong, then it would replicate down on the organization and all the uh, the team and the um, uh, the employees. They will they will feel the same because they in the end, I mean, they all they all copy us. You know, I mean, they copy us and they do exactly what we do. But if you look at many organizations and um, look at that um, the teams are not that uh, uh, successful, that they are not that uh, uh, strong. And in the end, it, it's a reflection of the leader. I had a conversation with a client once, which uh, was really opening my eyes. And uh, he said, and we had a conversation because he was uh, one of his uh, employees resigned. And um, then I asked him, okay, um, so how is the atmosphere in the company? And he said, yeah, it's uh, it's it's not good. And I said, why? Yeah, just because of me. I said, oh, why is that? Yeah, just I'm I'm in a bad mood. But uh, hey, this is how I am, you know. And then I said, uh, um, okay, um, listen, um, don't you think this is do you think this is the right approach to lead your organization? Because they will look at you. They will. Um, they will copy you, you know, and if you are in a bad mood, they will also be in a bad mood. And then he said, yeah, but this is just how I'm, how I am naturally, you know, and I don't want to change the way I show up. Oh, that's problematic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you think about what you just talked about, uh, that really then is, I would kind of put this together as, you know, resilient leaders are not afraid of change. Exactly. Uh, and change is essentially the fuel that creates um, productivity, that creates growth, that creates um, a, a, an amazing culture. But sometimes change can also mean failure. It, it, but it, if from failure, we learn. And another story. Um my, my my son is uh, in in school and he's writing a um and 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 kind of x x uh, kind of a test you know and uh uh he gets uh, i mean i was te i've learned with him uh, he he knew the topic inside out he goes in there writes the stuff and he gets a, a bad uh, um result and then i thought looked at this and then, why do you get this bad result and i looked at this and i said hey i mean this is um actually quite uh, okay you know yeah small things which you would have done differently but uh, then i talked to a teacher i'm normally not this kind of parent you know who goes to the teacher and and, and talks about uh, the results but i thought i thought this is not fair and um, 
she said, yes, um, I told them to do it this way. They should use a ruler, you know, to draw the lines and he does it by uh, hand. And this is why he gets uh, minus points and he gets a bad uh, result. So talking about failure and talking about change, these kids are not, they're not taught to, uh, to, um, to be creative and to, to, to learn. They are, they are taught to not make mistakes, you know, by following rules and by follow, using a ruler and by following, uh, learning what they, they've been told. So in, in, in today's business world, it's, it's so important to make, f to do things wrong, you know, to create failure because only then we learn. But we cannot, we cannot um, know everything and you cannot learn everything by by reading books and 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 uh, consuming content. You have to fail in order to evolve as an individual. And I think this is more and more important as more complex the world gets. So then the question then is is uh, if we fail, and failure means learning, then how fast do we actually get up? Exactly. And this is the resilience part. Yeah. Being able to, I mean, being able to get up fast. I mean, we do something, we fail, something knocks us down. And, uh, and the question is, what is the recovery time? And this is what we have to improve. We cannot, pre we cannot, uh, we cannot stop uh, failing. We cannot stop falling down because you will, as strong as you are, you will always be knocked off at some point. But the time it takes you to get up and get going again, this is the important thing. And this is resilience. Yeah, Shortening this time. Yeah? I mean, in the past, when I, um, in the beginning, when I started my business, you know, and I had a, I had a challenge and I had a, some hard uh, times with, uh, with clients or, or employees, it took me, days or weeks, you know, uh, to, to get over it. But after, I mean, after really understanding the, the, what is behind and, and, and training my mindset, I mean, I shortened this time dramatically. Yeah. It's all about state management. It's all about how you show up. And, uh, we always have ch challenges. We always have bad days, but, uh, Changing uh, your state in a, in a heartbeat is important to uh, to manage these these uh, challenges and to um, get up going again. So you mentioned improve our recovery time. Yeah, what are some shortened. strategies that leaders, reps, business owners can do to improve recovery time after failure? It's a very good question. Um, in the end. It's it's a process which uh, every thought we have is 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 controlled by our subconscious mind, and uh, when we think about a situation, uh, when we think about a problem or a challenge we have, then um, we often tell ourselves stories. You know what this challenge means, and and what this, uh, this, this, this situation means to us. And people often have the tendency to, um, to uh, paint the world very dark, you know, and uh, to, to tell yourself stories that uh, what could happen, you know, when uh, this situation uh, evolves. And this is something where everyone can, can learn and improve themselves that um, we give this situation a different meaning. I have a, one of the one of my um, mentors, I mean, uh, we, we, they all all know Tony Robbins, but he has a saying that life is happening for you, not to you. And whenever you whenever you wait, wait, fall wait, down, what is happening? One more time, what is life? For you? Life, life is happening ah. for you, not to you. So whenever we look at a situation where we uh, f have a challenge, where we face a difficult situation, where something is happening, we always have to ask ourselves. What does it really mean for us? Yeah, could be there something a learning for us that we can grow. And when I look back at my life, yeah, I'm 47 now, turning 48. When I look back at my life, actually, almost every big challenge I had led to something positive in the end. You know, 
losing a losing some business yeah freed up some resources to go for for a different business which was more enjoyable for me losing some friends maybe um changed the way i looked at things uh, and uh, and opened myself up to meet other people you know and once we are in a situation where we have this uh, this this challenge then sometimes we are overwhelmed and and think that this is a problem which persists but nothing persists you know nothing is permanent and there's always an opportunity to to grow to uh, develop new skills and to develop new strength for the next situation so it's, it's always a it's an up level way if you look at it in the right way so uh strategies then for improving recovery time that you talked about obviously the way we look at things mindset yeah um looking at um whatever may have happened it happened for you not to you and then looking at it and asking what does it mean for me yeah and what opportunity you could have to grow from this from this situation yeah what can you learn and how do you do that is this is it are, are, am i as a leader listening in am i Am I writing these things down and then reflecting on what that means? Is that a technique or am I just meditating on it and then saying I'm going to implement something different? Um, or is there something else that we can do to improve recovery time? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned uh, um, reflection and meditation. These are two very important uh, tools. So when I when I have a, a, an issue, a challenge, then I mean, I meditate every morning, for example in my process in my morning process and and i reflect and i i journal and i think about stuff which which happened and and of course when you are in a challenging situation um taking this topic and and looking at it ideally with a bit of distance you know and reflect okay what does it mean why did it happen uh what can i learn from it what can I do differently next time? Where could it lead me to when I master these, these skills, when I go through the process, when I develop the skills to, to manage this situation, what challenge can I manage next time? You know, so we all grow, we, uh, we growing our businesses and we can only grow our business when you also grow ourselves because, um, the Sebastian who ran his business 10 years ago, it's not a Sebastian who runs this business now. And will not be the Sebastian who runs this business in five or 10 years. So growing a business is always growing yourself as a leader. Got it. Okay. All right. Makes sense. And let's kind of switch gears into talking about high performance teams. Obviously, resilient leadership um, should breed and or create high performance teams, whether you're sales, whether you're accounts payable, whether you're, you know, product teams, um, how do we as leaders build high performance teams? We have a clear process when we work with our clients. I mean, first of all, I mean, we all know times have changed, you know, you don't hire people and they are just following you because you give them money. Yeah, I mean, who else is, who still is believing this? I mean, sorry, um, get an get an upgrade. Yeah, I mean, these these times are over. We we have to create a vision. We have to create a, a we have to inspire our 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 followers. In this case, our team. You know, to go in the direction we want to go. So, as a leader, you really have to be a great communicator, and you have to get the buy in from your team. This is this is utmost essential. Otherwise. You cannot motivate them to do what um, you want to do in the direct. You cannot motivate them to go in the direction you want to go if they don't, don't truly believe in in your mission, in what you want to achieve. Yeah, so this is this is number one, and uh, this is something you have to in, in, incorporate into the culture. The next thing is, uh, as this, the same way you as a leader have to grow your personality, you also have to offer your team members to grow your personality because mindset is first. I mean, business is 80% psychology and 20% strategies. Yeah? So helping them develop their own 
personality, helping them de develop their own strength is utmost important. And then, of course, you need to focus on the on the right skills. And what we do is um, we, ru we run uh, personality and, and skill assessments. So we have a, a proven process uh, um, which um, we use. It's, uh, it basically, it consists of three pillars. You know, it's uh, behavioral tendencies, um, motivators, and um, um, thinking, um, thinking patterns and biases. So everyone... Every person behaves, we have behavioral tendencies in us. I mean, you have, on one hand, you have a, like a typical CEO type of person, you know, very task-focused, go-getter, and very direct. This is one side of the spectrum. And on the other side, look at, a, for example, an accountant. You know, he's very data-focused, often a, a quiet person, more slow. He needs more information to, to, uh, to take decisions, and uh, he's a different to this typical CEO type of person. And in order to, to understand how to communicate with each other, you have to first of all understand what kind of personality you are and what uh, the needs and requirements are to talk to the, the other person. Because no personality is, is, is right or wrong. We are just different. Yeah? But we have to learn how to talk to each other. How to, we have to value the other individual. So this is this is one element. The other element is what is motivating us. Yeah, you have people who are motivated by power. You know they want to be in a leadership position. You have people motivated by by money, by return. You have people who are really theoretically motivated. So they really they have to understand everything inside out. They really have to go deep, and they they learn for hours before they uh, take a decision. And you have to, and you have people who are, for example, more altruistic, um, or um, other people they want a more simple solutions. And these, I mean, we're using seven motivators. Understanding these motivators is also a key requirement to to build a high performance team because then you know how these people tick, you know what they want, and then you can um, put them in the right. Uh, job and you give them right re rewards to perform. And the, the other thing is, is critical thinking. We all have biases. I mean, we all have, I mean, we are deep in our subconscious mind. We have experience, we have our own trauma, we have uh, our own stories and all this subconscious mind, all this uh, stuff which is stored here is influencing our decisions. So some decisions are biased. We cannot, we cannot um, avoid. I mean, we have to, we have to learn. We have to understand our bias in order to, in order to s avoid them when we make decisions. Yeah? And these three pillars: behaviors, motivators, and and critical thinking. This can be measured with uh, personality assessment. So we we run these uh, these assessments across the whole team, and then we basically create a a whole team map of uh, the different um, different personalities. And then you see where you might have friction in communication, where you might have people who are um, not at the ideal position. Yeah. So someone who's very, very um, data-driven, very um, more slow, is probably not the right um, salesperson, you know? So you need people focused uh, people in, in, a, in a sales position. You need people who are able to build rapport to the other individual, people who are following up, who are fast paced. This is a typical sales profile. And a developer profile is different. Yeah, so looking at these individual individual skill sets and, and, and personality assessment results really helps you to build a high performance team. And often you don't want to, or sometimes you don't want to change the team. You want to keep the people where they are, but then you have definite areas where you can help them develop their skills. Yeah. So say, okay. th yes, please. Oh, I was going to say one of the things you mentioned was <clears throat> that um, I'm curious, allow teams to grow their personality. 
What does that mean and how do you do it? Helping them, giving them. I run, I run, um, mainly run a team development events. We, um, we do this in a very engaging way. Um, I mean, I also want to have fun, you know, I, I, <laughs> I I'm not doing this uh, just uh, uh, for the money. So uh, we run um, high engaging events, most like often over the course of a week, you know, where every day we meet for an hour, for one and a half hour um, to, um, and talk about a certain topic. We put people into workout, uh, in, in, in breakout rooms, they work together on, on topics, they get homework. And we, we intentionally work on, uh, on uh, we, we put in a lot of personal development elements, yeah, like, like mindset, like uh, um, how to, how do you make a decision, you know, what is, what do you need to understand about yourself and about the others when you communicate with each other and so on. And this really helps them. And often, because personal development is nowhere taught in, in school, nowhere, it just opens their eyes. And I'm often told, so, hey, this is the first time in our life someone really cares about us. Someone really helps us to grow. Because, hey, we all want our people to grow because only when they grow, they can create better results for our companies, right? So it's our interest that uh, we help them to develop the skills, become better leaders, become better salesperson, become better, better people. Yeah? And building these, these elements into a training program is, uh, is not only uh, for, de for them to develop, it's also because if they develop they can create more results for the organization and they are, they are really happy and, uh, and um, grateful uh, because they, some of these, many of these people never uh, got trained in a, in a, in this way before. And, and how really accurate do you think the skill assessments are? For example, you mentioned that, and you just may have been using it as an example, I don't know, but someone who's a data-driven individual uh, may not be the best fit for a sales role, rather a more people-oriented individual. And I'm just using that because that's what you said. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. accurate, but if that is accurate, as an example, I am an extremely direct uh, uh, managing CEO. That is, I'm probably on the very, very right end of the spectrum in terms of direct approach. Mm -hmm. I will tell you exactly what I'm thinking. And there is clear and uh, there's uh, total transparency. Um, I'll, I'll never cuss and swear at you. Uh, that's absolutely not what I will ever will do. And you won't ever hear me do that. But uh, when it comes to data, um, I don't make decisions without looking at the data first. And then in the absence of data, if there is none, or the data is questionable, I go with the gut. And so I have a default pattern of the way I act and the way I think. Now, when you look at that on personality assessments, you've got a total split mind in certain areas and some things become dominant in some scenarios mm -hmm. and some yes. things become less dominant in other scenarios. So, you know, if we were to say, you know, hey, data-driven individuals probably shouldn't be in sales as an example, yeah, maybe, is it maybe this Maybe this was not well um, formulated. Um, data driven i'm just saying that uh, for a typical sales role what is important in a sales role is uh, building rapport to the client i mean this is one of the most important skills and if the person as an uh, individual doesn't have the skills to build rapport it's more like the the person who sits in a in a in a in a, i mean we had this um, in in the past you know i mean there's this typical picture of a developer sitting a uh, sitting in a cellar and coding, you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit of a stereotype, but let's talk about it in extreme. And in the, on the other hand, you have a very outgoing uh, individual who is uh, who's very well-spoken, who can build rapport and, and who is uh, very um, communicative. This is, for a salesperson, these are the skills you need for most of the sales roles. And when you can uh, identify and when you can measure these uh, these skills, and, and I personally think these assessments are very accurate. I'm as, I'm as, I'm always blown off when I have this assessment and I talk to a client and he really sees himself. Um, I did uh, uh, them over a period of uh, I don't know seven or eight years, and uh, uh, 
it's been always uh, very accurate. I think that this is um, it's, these are very helpful tools to um, really go down on the bottom and to help these people to develop. Yeah. I had a I had a um, I had a client. Uh, I was uh, working with a tax department of a of a larger corporate and uh, ten people. Nine of them are all in this uh, data driven. Uh, in the, it's called blue area, you know. And there was one guy who was completely different. And I was saying, hey, interesting, you know. Um, I w- I'm I'm really curious how this guy fits into the team, what he's doing. And then we had this workshop because I did the assessment before. And I was asking them, okay, uh, what is your role? And I said, yeah, I'm more the client outgoing person who I'm, I'm the relationship builder, you know, I'm the person in the organization who talks to the other departments. And then I said, yeah, this makes completely sense. Looking at this team. Yeah. And in, initially I was, I was, I was curious why this one guy had a complete different personality than all the rest of the team. And I thought maybe there's a conflict because the job of this team was running the tech statements for this corporate. After working with the team, I learned that uh, the role of this guy was not primarily working on the tech statements and doing all the detailed work. His role was talking to the other departments. He was the communicator in the team. He was the one who was uh, who was talking to the board, who was talking to um, to uh, other departments, and he definitely needed these these communication skills, building rapport and being more direct. Where the others they needed more the detailed skills to look at data, to analyze this, and to uh, to really get down on 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 this this problem. So it made completely sense, and uh, it it really showed that these these assessments they they work and they make sense a lot of sense. So there's a formula to be able to help you analyze your team, assessments, personality insights, thinking tendencies, behavioral patterns, the things that you just mentioned. But would you agree that there's no magic pixie dust, no no silver bullet? This is, we're looking at this in a holistic perspective, and we want to understand the people by which we're dealing with. Um, and... Uh, and more specifically, it takes focused time and effort to be able to build a leadership team that you want uh, in the organization. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. First of all, you have to be a charismatic leader who who is able to communicate his vision, who is able to to lead the people who who got the certainty, yeah, the resilience to uh, show them that uh, whatever happenings around us, uh, we are staying on track. We are following our goals and uh, all these these challenges in the world they um they won't they won't harm i mean of course things things can harm the company but we have to give our people the certainty that uh, that we follow through and uh, we are we are great leaders to uh, be able to to deal with all the uh, challenges around us yeah uh, and this is this is this is this is key so this is why resilient leadership comes first. And then we we need to be able to communicate our vision to our team to really get their buy-in. We have to help them develop their personality and we have to develop help them to de- develop their skills. And this is this we do by first learning their their, their st- looking at these three pillars, learning their behavioral tendencies, learning their knowing their motivators knowing their thinking patterns and using this to, first of all, build a powerful team, putting people on the right position and upskilling their um, their skills, helping them to communicate with each other, to understand each other, to really work together as, an, as, an, as a strong team. Roger, that makes total sense. Um, it was very enlightening when I was in uh, corporate working for a Fortune 100. Um, we decided that we were going to up-level the team and do our disk profile assessments and then have readouts and under, uh, working um, projects to understand that. And then we did all these different exercises within our, our organization to be able to um, understand how different thinking patterns 
go about solving us the same type of problem. Um, and it was very insightful to be able to understand that. And what it did help me um, is because I am a, a high D and a high I um, uh, on the DISC assessment, for those of you that are you know familiar with DISC, um, if not, just go look up high D, high I. Because I'm I'm all equally as high in both of those two two areas, um, what it helped me to understand is that not everybody in a leadership, uh, sorry, in a subordinate role, meaning that people reporting into my organization, understand my personality, especially when you're dealing with. Um, individuals who are more of the S and C on disc, right? And it could be folks that are in the operational role, as an example, it could be the finance team, it could be the accounts uh, payable organization, it could be the contracts team. Uh, but then certainly on the sales side, they understood that because most of us on the sales side were the D or an, uh, an I, some C S and Cs, but it was more Ds and Is. So um, everybody kind of got that whole thing, but everybody on this other side of the fence, they, they didn't get it. <laughs> So what I learned to do, especially having my own company, um, is I took a page out of Dropbox's playbook and early on Dropbox CEO uh, had, had an interview with the first thousand employees. Every single person who came to the organization he interviewed, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was the first thousand. Um, and specifically what I do in those sessions in my own company is, is I articulate exactly the type of leader that I am. And I give them a real life scenario of two different styles of leaders, same problem. How do you think each one addresses it? What do you think about this side? And what do you think about this side? And inevitably, the the B side is what I describe. And I don't tell them what, who I am yet. Um, I describe the A and the B side. And I ask them, which one do you like more? Right? And those that say the A side, I inform the hiring leader, FYI, this is going to be a problem. But those that say they like the B side, I remind them. 30 days, 60 days, 90 days into it. Remember you said you liked B? Here's B, let me tell you, right? Um, and so it has created a really good transparency for me as a leader to be able to help articulate my style because as I mentioned, you know, not everybody in the organization, especially in customer service, that, that you know, you, go, you talk directly at them like, as an example, why did you send this email out? Got it. Understood. Let me ask you this question. Did you think about that, 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 that or that, 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 that? No, I didn't even think about that. That's unacceptable. Right. <laughs> so so I might say that. And to a customer service um, uh, associate hearing that from the CEO, they're like, oh, and they might be like, oh, my God, like, how? oh, my, he's saying this to me. Oh, I feel horrible about myself. Right. Whereas the salesperson is like, boss, you're right. I'm sorry. Like, I totally screwed up. Right. Um, so the responses are different. But I've noticed that me as a leader, I. I am who I am and I'm wired a certain way and I'm extremely transparent in who I am. And I want people to realize it's just because I tell you that it's totally unacceptable or this is unacceptable or I'm not going to take no for an answer. And you should have thought about this because we gave you the tools, the equipment, the materials, the whatever it might be. I noticed that people um, now grow to appreciate who I am and they adjust as well. And then, of course, I adjust wherever I possibly can based upon their individual temperament, right? Um, because that's what a good leader should do. But I'm still wired a certain way. So that's one of the things that I've done um, over my career is, is to help people um, bear the directness uh, of Mario's approach um, uh, where, you know, other leaders, uh, I've had other leaders cuss and swear at me. And I'm like, dude, I, if you do, if one more S word, F word comes out of your mouth, I'm going to HR. Like, I don't take that. I don't like it. And I don't want it. Right. And so um, that's an example. There's other styles that people need to adjust and that are appropriate and not appropriate. But those are some, some of the things that I've done. I'd love your feedback. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I love transparency and uh, I mean, I, I need to copy this, this approach, you know, I love this, uh, giving them two different uh, styles and uh, letting them choose uh, <laughs> before you reveal yourself. Um, well, I, I mean, another story, yeah? I had a client and she, I mean, a very high, I mean, I, we work for fast growing tech companies. Yeah. So there's a lot of change. Fast growth means sometimes um, it's, it's a perceived instability. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it's instable, but it's perceived. There's so many things. They're chuckling so many um, balls around. And uh, she hired an executive assistant. And uh, this assistant had a very high S, meaning she needs lots of stability. Uh, unfortunately, 
she was hired before um they before I came in and, and run these assessments. And she wasn't happy with this person, you know. And then I said, okay, let's let's uh, look at uh, run this uh, and see what um what she's coming up with. And then she had this high S. And then I said, okay, I mean, this is this could be a reason for the problem because this person, and as I said, it's nothing, it's not bad or wrong. It's just how we are wired. You know, we are not bad people just because we need stability. But in a in an environment where things are constantly perceived as change, you know, and there's constantly new ideas and stuff flowing around. If you need high stability, then you might be in trouble because this overwhelms you as an individual. You don't do this person a favor when you put them in, put her in this position. When every half an hour you come with a new, new idea, you know, I mean, I'm a person Monday mornings, you know, I come into the office and say, Hey guys, you know, Oh, the weekend, I thought we, sh we can do this, you know, and then um, suddenly I have some, my ideas and they have to calm me down. I said, okay, we need to focus. We need to, you know, but um, we figured out that this person was not in the right position. So we moved her into a more administrative role and there she performed perfectly well because there she had a clear processes, structures, and uh, not all these different uh, changes and uh, new ideas every day. I love it. Very good. Sebastian, if uh, um, somebody wants to connect with you, what's the best way? Is it LinkedIn? Is it email, Twitter? For me, it's LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn. I'm a LinkedIn person. I love LinkedIn. I'm there quite active. This is how we met. So um, LinkedIn is awesome. That's right. So uh, and if someone wants to connect with you, just make sure when you got Sebastian's profile, it's Sebastian, as you would normally spell it, Shike, S C H I E. K E and make yeah, sure exactly. you say Sebastian. I heard you on the Modern Selling Podcast as a personalized connection request. Make sure you reach out to the to Sebastian, my friend. And Sebastian, I always ask uh, this question of all my guests. I'm looking for your all time favorite movie. What is it? My all time favorite. I mean, we talked a lot about um, resilience. And to be honest, I love Rocky. You know? uh, I love this this story and uh, his, his his journey and how he um, mastered all these challenges. And uh, and this for me, it's a perfect uh, perfect um, example for um, for resiliency and and certainty. And yeah, Rocky is it. Rocky, it is Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you that hopefully know Rocky Balboa. You'll know exactly what I just did. Uh, but yeah. those of you that don't, go watch the movie series. You'll love it. Watch You'll love it. And poor <laughs> Sylvester Stallone. I'm so sad that the guy never uh, figured out or arranged or negotiated, or I don't know what the problem was, the rights to the ownership of Rocky Balboa. Uh, and I think uh, he's fighting for that right now in courts as we speak because of what right. they've done. So I don't think he's going to win. But unfortunately, um, that's a, 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 a very, very bad situation for him. But nonetheless... For all of you listening in right now, Sebastian, thank you for joining me. And all of you, do not turn that dial. Listen to this very important message right now. Thanks for listening to the Modern Selling Podcast. Please do me a huge favor and give the Modern Selling Podcast a five-star rating and review on iTunes. Oh, and don't forget, if you'd like to save 20 hours or more in a month and increase your productivity, Go right now and download Fly Message. That's flymsg.io for free. It's your free text expander and personal writing assistant. Hey, thanks for listening in. And until the next episode, good selling.